Yes, indeedy, folks. It's the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Let's celebrate our fourth adventure as we drive the necklace round the Albions. You'll remember that the necklace round the Albions is the little drive that goes through Albion, through Almo, and at the very bottom of the necklace, the jewel called City of Rocks. When we went through the beautiful City of Rocks, we divided it into three drives, the first and second pretty well going along the old California Trail, and the third going up through the south and the west portion, a ridge that runs up along the side of the City of Rocks itself campgrounds and people climbing stunning rock formations abounded. Today we will be leaving the City of Rocks on the west side, the north entrance, and we will be driving up the Junction Valley Road up to Oakley. Having just left the City of Rocks, we take a very steep and rough road down into Junction Valley. To our north are stunning rock cliffs. These all broken up and not at all like the big rounded boulders of City of Rocks just to the east. Across Junction Valley we see the gorgeous colors of fall and the occasional ranch. Looking to the north and the west, we get a sense of the long and broad valley we will be driving up as we go toward Oakley. After a couple of miles, we reach the Junction Valley Road in the heart of the valley. Oakley, 15 miles to the north, Lynn, Utah, 17 miles to the south. Looking to the south, toward Lynn, we see the cutoff that goes up into the City of Rocks National Reserve. Turning to the north on Junction Valley Road, we head off on our adventure. We had seen this little road running along the valley as we came down from the City of Rocks. As we inched down the road and turned continuously trying to avoid the worst of the bumps, I must admit seeing the little road in the bottom of the valley had made me think, oh, it'll probably be a nice, smooth, pleasant road. Well folks, I've been wrong before and I was wrong that time too. This little road up Junction Valley is one washboarded long road. It was not until we reached pavement that we avoided washboards for any longer than a hundred or two yards on this road. It made me think that if I were to tell people to go adventuring in City of Rocks, I would recommend you drive around on the other side and avoid this road altogether, both on the in and on the out. But I must admit, it was a beautiful valley and I'm glad that I took the road, especially since we found a couple unexpected surprises on our way back to Burley. Here is one of those surprises. We noticed a couple places 
where there were large stacks of flat stones that had been obviously quarried out of the hills. It turns out that this is Rocky Mountain Quartzite. It's a building material that they take out of Middle Mountain. We are driving toward the town of Oakley, and it turns out that one of the things that Oakley is famous for is its Oakley Stone, this Rocky Mountain Quartzite. In fact, the material is shipped throughout the world. We came across one of the largest elderberry bushes I have ever seen. It qualified as a tree. The agriculture becomes more and more farm-like as you go up the valley until eventually you enter a short section of canyon land. And there, just on the other side of the canyon land, is, yes, pavement. Glorious, precious pavement. I must admit, ever since I was a kid, I have spent and I continue to spend a lot of time on dirt roads. But folks, I certainly understand why people of my parents' generation were more than willing to pave roads. The dust, the mud, the washboards. Who needs them? After a short drive into the Snake River Plain, the road we're on turns to the west. Coming into Oakley, you notice another road just to the north of us that is going to be merging with the road we are on. Right at the point of where these two roads come together, I noticed this sign. I thought it was curious and wanted to take a photograph. So I went down to the junction, I turned around, and I drove back through this gravel road that connects the two roads and took a picture of it. While I was doing that, I realized that the person who lives there, of course, is talking about burying anybody who uses this cutoff that goes across his land. Oakley is quite a little town. It was founded by William Oakley. He was the proprietor of a Pony Express station. There was a springs called Oakley Meadows, two miles west of the town site now, and he ran his Pony Express station out of that springs. The town in 2000 had a census of 668. For such a small town, it claims a long history of very prominent citizens. One of its members became one of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles for the LDS Church. GOP presidential contender Mitt Romney has roots to this town as does Governor Huntsman of Utah. With its quaint Victorian and other buildings, this town has been commented on as the very last Mayberry left in America. When we finished driving through pleasant farmland in the Snake River Plain and reached the city of Burley, 
we noticed the China First restaurant on one of the streets in downtown Burley before you get to the freeway. We stopped by for some tasty meals before an easy drive back to Boise. Of trails, and roads, and rails. Idaho's unique link through the city of rocks. From 1843 until the early 1860s, there was no reason to stop along the Oregon Trail or the California Trail as the immigrants passed through Idaho. The promise of rich farmland, well irrigated in California and in the Willamette Valley, made it so immigrants weren't much interested in the deserts of Idaho, even when there was a pleasant stream running through it, like the Boise River. The fact is, running wagons across the West was rough going. A man could walk faster than emigrants were getting their wagons across these trails. Fifteen miles was a good day. You could have a broken wheel, would slow the whole wagon down. A lame animal, of course, was disastrous. And there are always times when you had to stop and bury your wife or your child or your husband, who woke up this morning feeling well, were sick with cholera by noon, and by the afternoon were dead. It was recorded that toward the end of the emigration period, there were 10 graves for every mile, one grave every 10th of a mile. Next time you're driving across the mountain home desert and noticing your little odometer clicking off a 10th of a mile pretty rapidly, think about having passed the grave of someone laying beside the road, who had succumbed to the rigors of travel. A few people turned back, and even after reaching Oregon and California, some people decided it was not for them and turned around and went back on the trails. But they were very few, not even to visit family. The movement from the west back to the east truly began in the early 1860s when that precious material, gold, was discovered in southern Idaho. Suddenly, southern Idaho needed a river of supplies. It needed picks and shovels. It needed jeans. It needed food. It needed everything that these early miners were requiring as they spread out through the land. As placer mining gave way to hard rock mining, it got to where mills needed to be built and heavy metal stamps had to be brought in. This photograph is of a stamp mill on the Yankee Fork in Custer, Idaho. It has five stamps. Of course, the wooden parts of these stamp mills were hewn on site, but the metal had to be brought from California or the East. These mills were being set up all over Southern Idaho. And this is a small one. In Rocky Bar, they've set up a 50 stamp stamp mill. That's correct, 5-0. Imagine how much metal had to be brought across the mountains to Rocky Bar. The only way to bring in these tons of supplies that were required every year, these picks and shovels and clothes and food, these stamps and these boilers, everything that was needed was to bring them up from California. Materials were brought up the Sacramento River to Chico. 
There they were put on wagons and brought back on the California Trail to Winnemucca. From Winnemucca, they were brought into Idaho, primarily following the route that is today's U.S. Highway 95. Silver City was a going concern at the time, a huge producer of silver, and most of the supplies did come by way of Silver City and then back down the mountain, up into the Boise Basin, and on to Rocky Bar, Ketchum, and the rest of southern Idaho. It was, needless to say, a grueling job, dusty and difficult. Sometimes a wagon was lucky enough to get some furs or something else that would pay on the trip back to California, but usually they returned empty. Wagon masters were smart enough to know not to attempt this route between September and April because of snow. These supply wagons were heavy and slow. It was known that you could only do one run a year. However, as Southern Idaho grew, it got to where these cumbersome, slow-moving wagons were not the only vehicles sharing the California and Oregon Trail with the immigrants. The United States government let out mail contracts to the tune of $150,000 to $200,000 for stage operators to get the mail through this district in a timely manner. These stage services literally flew past the immigrants and the supply wagons. As we shall see, they covered as many as 240 miles in as little as 40 hours, an astonishing six miles an hour. Their story is convoluted and filled with many, many stories of one man buying out another, buying part of a line, letting go a part of his line when a contract with the mail ran out. In southern Idaho, one of the better known of these stage companies was the Overland Stage Line. The Oregon and California trails had become known as the Overland Road. The Overland Stage Company served from Salt Lake to The Dalles, Oregon, as well as running up into Walla Walla and Umatilla. This photograph is actually of an Overland stagecoach. One of the places that these coaches were built was in Boise, Idaho. There were many other stage lines in the area, of course. It was, after all, by far the quickest way to get around. As we shall see, it was quicker than riding your own horse. Just as southwestern Idaho was growing because of the discovery of gold and silver, eastern Idaho and northern Utah were growing because of Mormon settlement. By the early 1860s, stage lines were established around the north end of the Great Salt Lake. These stage lines served the growing communities around the north end of the lake and into southern Idaho. These stage lines at the north end of the Great Salt Lake shared a junction that was in the barren marshlands that are in the flat to the north of the Great Salt Lake. Within a few years, this desolate junction between roads would become known as a thriving little burg called Kelton. The event that would turn this tiny little junction into a thriving community was a nationwide event, actually. When completed, the entire nation went on a great celebration, although not because of the establishment of Kelton, rather because of something that happened 20 miles to the east of Kelton. The event to this day is one of the great struggles and triumphs of mankind. The event was coming toward Kelton from both Nebraska and from California. The event 
was laying a horizontal ladder across the nation called the Transcontinental Railroad. On October 1st, 1868, the rail line was opened to Winnemucca. Freight haulers could now make dozens of deliveries a year. The grueling stage rides were shortened. Central Pacific crews were laying railroad tracks at an alarming rate from California, sometimes as many as 10 miles in a day. One story tells of the Union Pacific crew reaching Cheyenne, Wyoming. The city put on a huge celebration knowing their town was now fixed to the map. By the time the speeches were over, the track laying crew was already two miles to the west of the town heading toward Utah. After only seven months from reaching Winnemucca, the railroad tracks reached Kelton. Supplies could now be delivered easily all the way to Kelton, a much, much easier way to take supplies up into Ketchum, Rocky Bar, and the central Idaho mountains. Within a month, the rail had been laid from the west by Central Pacific Railroad and from the east by Union Pacific Railroad and the link at Promontory, the Golden Spike, had been driven. The driving of the Golden Spike on May 10th, 1869, was telegraphed throughout the United States and throughout the world. The nation celebrated with phenomenal fireworks and the world looked at America with awe. But no one was more prepared for the moment than John Haley, who Haley, Idaho is named after. With the driving of the Golden Spike, transportation not only from the west, but from the east, was opened up. Suddenly, the closest and most reliable point for Boise to reach the railroad was through Kelton. Haley's Utah, Idaho, and Oregon Stage Company was at the bit. John Haley was an interesting man with many careers, including being an Idaho politician. And John Haley had a sense of the spectacular, the unusual, and the beauty. At the time, there were basically two routes from the stop at Kelton up into south and western Idaho. Albion, in the beautiful Marsh Valley, stood at the edge of the desert. There was nothing beyond Albion. There was no irrigation, so all of what we now think of as Burley and Twin Falls just simply was not there. It was desert. This route up through Albion and into the desert continued to be the preferred route for most heavy wagons. But John Haley insisted on running his stagecoaches on an alternate route that took them down through City of Rocks, simply so that there would be a stage stop in the City of Rocks for people to get out and wander at the awe of nature. The routes were about equally as long. The City of Rocks route did go over more difficult passes, and in the winter, it got snowed in. John Haley would have stages taken off their wheels and put on skids. Using these, he would sled his passengers across the City of Rocks route as late as he could. Even so, from November through May, he had to break down and take his stages through Albion. The Utah, Idaho, and Oregon Stage Company was known by different names. Also going by the Overland Stage Company, the Northwestern Stage Company, and other various names, John Haley's Stagecoaches traveled 240 miles from Boise to Kelton. The road was always rocky, pitchy, 
and, if not dusty, muddy. There were delays crossing the Snake River on a ferry. There were slow spots going up sheer cliff walls. One of the most stunning and difficult of these was the Kelton Ramp, just east of Boise. Hardly visible today, the ramp was an essential part of getting the stages up onto the desert and the old Oregon Trail in a timely manner. It was, indeed, a great highway improvement. There was a sheer cliff on one side. The rocks that held up the ramp made for a sheer drop-off on the other side. Four or six horses, depending on the stage, would be walking over these rocks, pulling a wagon between these two spaces, the drop-off and the cliff. I have trouble thinking of driving a stagecoach up this ramp, much less driving one down. Obviously, you would not run horses up this ramp. You would damage the horses and or the coach, if not be just plain old thrown off this narrow little path. Even in the good parts, where the road was quite a bit of dirt, there were still constant holes and rocks and pitches. Given all of this, John Haley's horses and stage masters made the 200 and 40 mile trip in 40 hours, less than two days. Except in extremely difficult spots where he could damage the stage or the horses, the horses ran all the time. Except for brief rests to eat, the stage was kept rolling 24 hours a day. Moonlight was handy, of course. Without it, lanterns and the memory of the stage master and the horses got them through. And that's another Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time when we'll look at how you can possibly run horses for 40 hours. It has to do with why they were called stage coaches. In the meantime, be thankful you don't have to travel by stage and keep celebrating the Great Wahoo!